owned or controlled by the state, including the uh, media, including the ideas, including freedom of discussion and everything. There is no freedom of discussion. Now, between those two ways, the free society and the totally controlled society, there are, of course, variations. I think what we've learned in Britain is that we've gradually, over the last certainly 12 or 13 years, with perhaps a little interruption, gone slowly further and further away from the free society towards something else. <coughs> At the same time, we found, I don't find it strange, but some other people do, that we have stopped creating wealth. We've had a large number of increasing restrictions, and you've been finding two things. First, that we are more and more concentrating on redistributing the wealth we've got rather than creating any more. To create more, you need a slightly freer society and you need an incentive society. Naturally, when I see that happening, I look with very great alarm to societies which have gone even further left. That is, they've tried to redistribute even more and haven't had the incentives for people working hard on their own account, doing well for their families, and often then being able to create jobs for others, they've produced a much more prosperous society than we have. But by and large, you've got the two broad, different economic and political approaches. In a recent, um, uh, and if I may say, it's a very moving talk that you gave on Ian McLeod, mm -hmm. you quoted the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the Mr. 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 Callaghan, who said in 1960, I have not uh, the slightest doubt that the economic uh, measures and the socialist measures which one will find in the countries of Eastern Europe will become increasingly powerful against the uncoordinated planless society in which the West is living at present. Now, we assume that since 1960 Mr. Callaghan has learned something, right? It would be impossible not to, I trust. Oh, no. I think I, I know lots of people who haven't learned anything since 1960. I hope they never come on your program. Well, I wish some of them would. I don't think Mr. Bretzenev has learned a great deal since 1960. But then, you see, they have no free play of ideas in that society. That's one of the points that I started well, with. Well, no, Bre Unless Bretzenev you is allowed freedom. to read. He, he has a secret library in which he can read the Reader's Digest. Yes, that. indeed. But yeah. unless you have freedom of discussion, over a whole society, you soon cease to have any new ideas. Don't you find that new ideas develop when you can talk about them with other people? If you can't discuss them freely because there is a correct view, you soon cease to have new ideas. Now, the interesting thing, I think, in the Soviet Union is that a good deal of the, the different mm -hmm. views come from people who have to be trained to think mm -hmm. in the scientific sphere because Russia would never have had some of her achievements. After all, she did get up the first Sputnik, unless she'd trained people to think in the scientific sphere. Now, you can't train them to think in maths and science without having the power for thought and thinking new ideas spilling over. And it's interesting to me, you see, that a lot of your people who've been thinking new political thoughts, unwelcome to the regime, have often been those who've come from the scientific sphere. And I think in many ways American politics have been, well, they are very different because you have two parties based on a free society mm -hmm. or free enterprise society and economic freedom. We have one party based on that, one main party, and another one based on socialism. But you see, for years now in British politics, this word, you must use it, consensus, has reared its head. You must have a consensus. Uh, it's, a, it's a word, again, you used not to use when I first came in politics. We had convictions. And we tried to persuade people that our convictions were the right ones. And it's no earthly good having convictions unless you have the will to translate those convictions into action. But politics was <coughs> more, if you had convictions, than a matter of multiple maneuverings to get through the problems of the day. I often think when you're going for consensus, so often it means that those who believe as I believe tend to give in to the left wing and you steadily move further and further left. Now, I am in politics because of conviction, but I know that the, one, the last election, the previous election, was fought in Britain on what I think is one of the most damning sentiments ever uttered. 
and it was by the predecessor to Mr. Callaghan, uh, Harold Wilson. What the British people wanted, he said, was a bit of peace and quiet, anything for a quiet life. Now, you know and I know that this is the great drag on democracy, that people will say, does my voice count? Can I do anything? And therefore, they leave it to a tiny, well-organized minority. Now, you ask, have people learned? Yes, they are learning that if you do leave it to that tiny, well-organized minority... Unpleasant things happen. Unpleasant things happen, and you then recoil from that. Mm -hmm. In part, you expect your politicians to do something mm -hmm. about it. The question is whether the people themselves will back up the politicians. What is it that uh, ultimately transforms experience into guidance? I give you. Uh, I give you a recent example. It's conviction from and determination. W well, well it's, it's also. It's surely it's a hierarchy of values, isn't it? Because uh, if uh, if by experience you find that uh, you lose a certain amount of liberty yes. in return for a precarious security, yes, you and, decide and you what don't, matters and you don't to mind, you. Then you don't. Yeah. Yeah, you call learn, it a hierarchy yeah. of values. I say what matters to you. Okay. And if I lose liberty, then it takes away the basic reason for living. So what is if you're the sort of person who doesn't mind about having any liberty provided you've got a house and food coming to you and you will do what you're told to do, mm -hmm. uh, then perhaps you won't mind. I suppose it's the difference between being born free and living life like an animal at the zoo in a cage. Yeah. All right, um, some animals do live lives in cages. Um, but, I mean, for me, freedom yeah, is most, part most of life. It's all... <laughs> well, so, so we're, we're I only use that as an example to show that the, the difference between you can have total security without any freedom. Sure, sure. But now the, I, I was about to, to some people, was, that would be attractive. Not to me at all. I, I was about to give you an example uh, of something recently written by an eminent professor of economics called George Stigler, the University of Chicago. And he said, you know, there... there there are a few things that economists know with the force of certitude. Uh, there are a huge number of things about which we are very vain that we don't know at all. But certain things we do know. And uh, one of them, for instance, is that minimum wages will not raise the level of income. Now, he said, any further demonstration of this is entirely supererogatory. It's just known. However, Neither the Republican Party in America nor the Democratic Party would ever dare to come out in opposition to the minimum wage because the superstition is endemic that the, su that the minimum wage actually elevates the income of, a, of poor people. In fact, poor people are precisely who are hurt by a minimum income. Now, in the British experience with socialism, there must be uh, counterparts to the minimum wage, things that, as you pointed out in that heated exchange last week, on which I congratulate you, by the way, with the Prime Minister citing all of his uh, predictions over a period of four or five years, each one of which turned out to be wrong, question, what is it that people learn from this experience, or is there something that prevents them from learning in the light of the depreciated value of human freedom? I think there are two things. Well, there's an awful lot in what you said, and I'll just try to, to remember it all. But you can learn quite a lot from experience. That's one thing. There's something after that. Have you the will and determination to do anything about it? Why should you not or, have? Well, I'm afraid some people don't. I mean, just the lack of the exertion they, or they the would, risk? The exertion. They would prefer to take the easy way. The hard way is tough, by yeah. definition. Yeah, yeah. Many people would prefer to have it easier, anything for a quiet life. Yeah. What the British people want is a bit of peace and quiet. Others, others of us know we can rise to higher and better things than that and believe that's part of our purpose in life. So there are two things. One, you recognize what is happening. Two, are you prepared to do anything about it? Now, you make the point about minimum income. I think in societies where there are enormous differences between very great wealth and very great poverty, I would recoil from that. You recoil from what? 
from enormous differences between very great wealth in the presence of very great poverty. That, that no, 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 no. Yes, but it has. One moment. What? You wait. I'm coming to okay. that. So there is, therefore, something to be said for a certain amount of redistribution there from, by taxation, and you've done it as well as we have. This is what taxation is about. So you do do a certain amount of redistribution from those. Well, I, yes, I know you're getting very irritated, but just wait one moment. <laughs> Uh, from those uh, to, to try to help people who are poverty stricken to get up off the floor and raise their standard. And we would call that, that not a minimum wage, yeah. we would call that a basic safety net. And we would accept a moral commitment in a kind of society like yours or ours that jointly we do try to guarantee some basic standard of life and indeed um, uh, rather more than a basic standard of life. But there are certain um, benefits you can get from Social Security, and we both agree on that. Now, what has happened to us is that the redistribution process has gone on so much further that the standards here, say in earnings, are our lowest income earners earn about half average earnings, and our top in net take-home pay our top income earners only times. earn about four times. So that's a, a comparatively narrow gap. As a matter of fact, it happens to be narrow, isn't it, in Soviet Russia. Now, once you compress the incentives from the top down and say, it doesn't matter how much you earn, I'm going to take the lion's share away from you, then they say, all right, I'm no longer going to do the lion's part. And then they stop creating the extra wealth which would both benefit them and benefit society as a whole. Once they stop doing that, they don't benefit, <coughs> then there aren't any extra taxes to improve the schools or the social services. Now, do you see there is some point in some societies in a degree of redistribution, but once it becomes a depression on incentive to get on by your own effort, then you're denying all people the means of increasing the wealth of our people individually and as a whole. Sure. And you, 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 you just become, as we have become, you're making the a point stagnant of, right. society. You're making the point of counterproductivity. After I'm all, sure it, it you'll was, have a piece of jargon for it. Well, count, counterproductive, I don't think that's just an Americanism, is it? Uh, well, I, I think they use the term in Britain. Is, um, uh, it means that yes. you try to do one thing, but the, yes. the opposite happens. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Indeed, yes, it and is. So, it's so a re redistribution press beyond yes. a certain point yes. Uh, yes. actually hurts the people yes. who are designed to be bene to Indeed, benefit. Yes. Yes. That the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the point, uh, what, what you have done it's is to have made, a a pra you've made a pragmatic uh, uh, a demonstration, but uh, it is not, it's not one that exactly touched on a, a slightly different point made by Professor Stigler. I'm sorry, Profe let's get Professor back to Professor Stigler. Well, Professor Stigler's point is that. Um, that you cannot no, no, effectively uh, increase yeah. uh, the wages of the poorest people in a society by fiat. Uh, exactly. What, would you, what you do is but cause I unemployment. Did, I did, with respect, touch on it because I said once you stop those people in society who are capable of creating wealth, who can start up a business from nothing, mm -hmm. build up a big business, yes, they benefit themselves, but look at the number of people they employ. Once you stop those wealth creators from creating the wealth, then there's nothing extra to distribute. And once society has just become a means, economically, of shuffling round the shekels you've got, mm -hmm. rather like passing the parcel, because who gets fetid. it? Yeah. Then your society as a whole doesn't gain. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I have touched on it. You've got to keep the incentives going at the top. And I don't care where the top comes from. I'm not concerned. This is one of the great things that has always attracted me about um, American society and uh, now attracts me uh, about the kind of uh, political faith I have. I couldn't care two hoots where a person comes from. Look at their background. We try to give them a better and better background insofar as the state can. What I care about is what they've got to contribute to society. And we so fix the tax laws and the other laws that they can make that contribution because the increasing wealth will only come from there.